Hello. We're going to be using Responsive Prayer 1, page 282 in the Lutheran Service Book. Holy God, holy and most gracious Father, have mercy and hear us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I cry to you, O Lord, in the morning my prayer comes before you. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. My mouth is filled with your praise, and with your glory all the day. Every day I will bless you, and praise your name forever and ever. By awesome deeds you answer us with righteousness, O God of our salvation, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. He redeems your life from the pit, and crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Hear my prayer, O Lord, let my cry come to you. The text for meditation is about the first two-thirds or so of Job chapter 19. So this is Job's response to Bildad, the, the second friend. Uh, Bildad just had his second speech in the book. Um, notable would actually be that this is the middle of the dialogue uh, between Job and the three friends. So you have three speech cycles, and one friend goes, then Job goes, then the second friend, then Job, then the third, then Job, and then you start over again. Uh, this is Job's uh, second response in the second cycle, which means that this is basically the middle of the dialogue. Why is that significant? Well, in in uh, Hebrew, the Hebrew writing style, they they don't tend to do a linear progression of thought. That's <coughs> that's more of a Greek thing. Uh, so you'll find this a little bit more in, in the New Testament, but with at least some of the books in the New Testament, uh, Romans, the Book of Romans, is definitely this way. You have a definite buildup of thought, but um, the Hebrew mindset is more of a kind of a cyclical thing, so you repeat ideas, and um, when you enter into a new cycle, you're adding some ideas in there. So uh, Job, in this cycle, he's very much focused on kind of the mediating figure. Uh, this was actually introduced way back, um, middle of, of the first cycle of speeches, when Job was asking for an arbiter between him and God. And then uh, Job kind of brought, brought this back through the idea of resurrection as he's transitioning into the second cycle with, in chapter 14. And then Job uh, touches on the idea of a, kind of a mediating figure again, uh, this time a witness. He's calling him a witness, somebody of legal defense. Um, uh, that, that appears in, in the first speech of this second cycle, which is chapter 16. And then uh, now Job in chapter 19, he's going to be focusing on uh, the Redeemer, the Redeeming figure. We're not going to be reading the Redeeming figure yet because we're also looking at what's coming before. So what's coming before is also one of the highlights of the book uh, because, within again, within the Hebrew mindset, you have cyclical um, progression of thought. But in addition to this, you usually... Within a cycle, place, place the climax at the at the middle, not towards the end, as you would in in uh, the modern construction of style, which is closer to the Greek. So Job's climax is actually going to be basically Job nineteen, and in Job nineteen you'll have um, Job's ideas most articulated, which would be the redeeming figure, 
which will come in towards the end, but you will also have uh, his view about God and God's role within his life at this exact point in time, not thus far exactly. Because uh, Job was blessed for quite some time. Job is not focusing on that. He's focusing on his loss, what, what, uh, what has caused his grief. So with Job chapter 19, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be reading verses 1 to 22 and focusing on basically uh, Job's I guess you could call it antithesis. So Job's hope, the, the, the thesis of the book, is really the Redeemer. So before Job can get into that, he has to look at the depths of pain that he has. And this is well articulated within chapter 19, which some of the most beautiful poetry in the book, but also some of the most devastating poetry in the book, as you might observe as we get into it. So Job chapter 19, beginning in verse 1. How long will you torment me and crush me with words? Ten times now you have reproached me, shamelessly you attack me. If it is true that I have gone astray, my error remains my concern alone. If indeed you would exalt yourselves above me and use my humiliation against me, then know that God has wronged me and drawn his net around me. I'll break there. This is only the first six verses, but I'll break there for, for the moment. So this is addressed to the friends. So he's asking the friends, how long will you torment me? Uh, the friends have been practically persecuting Job lately, like in the, um, in the early couple speeches, they're trying to give Job the benefit of the doubt, but now they're just accusing him of suffering because of some sort of hidden sin, uh, and we know that this sin is imaginary. So, Job, when he's speaking to the friends and basically addressing what's come before, he's speaking against them and he said, well, if it's true that I have gone astray, that I have sinned, well, then my error remains mine, my concern alone. Shut up. It's my problem. You don't need to accuse me of this. And uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the book thus far, when Job is talking to the friends specifically, has been him saying, well, I know everything you know, so I should be able to discern what's right and what's wrong in my own life. So that's why Job's saying, no, don't tell me what's wrong. Uh, because in the Christian church, uh, well, and also in the, the Judaism, you do want somebody to rebuke you if you are committing sin, so that you may be convicted of the sin and repent and, and uh, basically turn away from the sin. So that's a good thing, but if you know you have this sin and you're trying to stop, it doesn't necessarily help that people are trying to shove the sin in your face. Uh, say, say if you have a, a, a chronic sin that you're trying to, trying to beat, uh, having a friend who keeps reminding you that you've sinned and you've sinned and you've sinned and you've sinned, it's just kind of uh, deepening the guilt and the shame, which is not helping the problem, it's really just digging it deeper. Um, when, when you're in these types of repetitive sins, uh, the chronic sins, what actually helps is you not focusing on the sin, but actually focusing on Christ, his redeeming work for your life, uh, the salvation that you find in him. Um, and as Job is going to get into, he doesn't really have this, this particular comfort because he doesn't necessarily see God as loving in this point in time. And Job's articulation of, of his situation, his grief, which is what I'm going to continue covering, um, this is Job really you bringing out, this is why I'm so devastated, uh, this is why I don't feel like I have hope, and when we look at this kind of objectively from a th third party standpoint, or a second party standpoint, uh, we can see just how low Job feels. So if he's ruminating on his grief, on his losses, on his on any possible shame that he's experiencing. Shame is not guilt, he's not culpable under the law, but he feels like as though uh, he's being persecu persecuted under the law anyways. Uh, this is what forgiven sinners feel like, they have shame. It's not that they are uh, um, culpable for their sins because they're forgiven for their sins, but the shame is basically uh, a continued suffering from this sin that has already been forgiven and put behind you. So shame in itself is not something that God is putting against you, but something from within that is harming you. 
So in order to live a happy life, you would hope that shame would be put aside. But getting over shame is easier said than done. Uh, sometimes this just requires more participation within the church because in the church you have people who are willing to be around you, support you, love you. And whenever you're experiencing shame, what you actually need is love. So the church as the place wherein you receive the love of God through the word and the sacraments and wherein you receive the love of your brothers and sisters in Christ, this is what can help bring you out of shame. Um, bring you out of the consequences of your sin within this world to, to see uh, the glory of the world come in our Lord Jesus Christ. Which is why, after Job goes through what we're going to be covering today, he goes into the I Know My Redeemer Liz passage because he's looking for this hope to bring him out of this darkness. But what is this darkness? Verses 7 to 22. Though I cry, I've been wronged, I get no response. Though I call for help, there is no justice. He, God, has blocked my way so I cannot pass. He has shrouded my paths in darkness. He has stripped me of my honor and removed the crown from my head. He tears me down on every side till I am gone. He uproots my hope like a tree. His anger burns against me. He counts me among his enemies. His troops advance in force. They build a siege wrap against me and encamp around my tent. He has alienated... <clears throat> Actually, I'll stop there again. So verses 7, 7 to 12. What is Job trying to say? Job is saying that he feels as though God has laid siege against him. That God has encircled him and is waging war against Job's very house. So Job feels that God is against him and that he has no help in this world. Um, is this true to the situation? No, it's not true to the situation. God is actually the one encamping around Job, not to attack him, but to protect him from that which is outside. So Job absolutely is besieged in the sense that uh, Satan is trying to work his way in, trying to destroy Job, uh, trying to claim Job's very soul. But God... As we saw in the introduction, uh, which is the first two chapters, Job, sorry, God has forbidden Satan from taking Job's life. So God is encamped around Job, but in a very different way than Job understands it. So God is actually protecting the little Job has left, namely his life, rather than uh, God trying to strip away everything around Job. But... Job, in his grief, is not understanding this. He's basically just seeing God as the one who is, is the prime actor in his, in his afflictions. So, God is the primary one that, God, that Job is concerned about here. Because Job wants to have a functional relationship with his Lord, and that's why he's talking about the arbiter in chapter 9, the uh, witness in heaven in chapter 16, and the Redeemer, which we'll meet later on in chapter 19, is that Job wants to be in a proper relationship to God. He wants his relationship with God restored so that he can live in faith and in righteousness once more. He does not want to be in a constant state of loss and grief, but wants to be closer to God. And this is something that we all experience. Uh, even though people in this world will attribute all their hardships to God in some way, shape, or form, and that's not a completely... Uh, um, completely false is that because God does visit some punishments in this world, as well as um, allowing certain things to happen to us to test us, as God allowed things to happen to Job in order to test him. But it's not as though God has completely abandoned us, nor is it as though God disowns our lives. Our lives are still, still belong to God, and he will still protect them for as long as our lives are in his care by faith. So in faith, we are with God. It is by faith that God gives to us his life so that we may be protected in this world. Uh, through faith, we receive the blessings of God and maintain eternal life, um, or have our eternal, li eternal life maintained. So it's not a product of ourselves, but something that God does uh, for us and to us. 
But Job, recognizing that his his connection to God is, is in jeopardy. Uh, Job is attributing this to God himself, um, not understanding why he's being tried at this point in time. Uh, Satan is the one who has been in the, uh, what we call the efficient cause, the one who's actually doing these things. He's the one who's been cutting Job off, but Job is now ascribing his, his various losses to God. So in the next section here, Job is going to be articulating these various losses. So. Continuing with verse 13 in Job chapter 19. God has alienated my brothers from me. My acquaintances are completely estranged from me. My kinsmen have gone away. My friends have forgotten me. My guests and my maidservants count me a stranger. They look upon me as an alien. I summon my servant, but he does not answer, though I beg him with my own mouth. My breath is offensive to my wife. I am loathsome to my own brothers. Even the little boys scorn me when I appear. They ridicule me. All my intimate friends test me. Those I love have turned against me. I am nothing but skin and bones. I have escaped with only the skin of my teeth. So I'll stop there for the moment. So Job is now articulating his um, estrangement from God, or at least his perceived estrangement from God. Remember, God is, God is always there encircling Job so that Job's life may be protected. The same thing that he does for us. He protects our lives, though um, many even evils in this world try to assail us and try to take us down. But they cannot conquer because God is the one who is actually providing the defense, not us. We can be easily overtaken by the evils of this world. In fact, we we were easily overtaken by the evils of this world when we were, were in uh, our original sin, that uh, we were completely corrupted, where no part of us was pure and perfect. It had to be God who removed uh, the guilt of sin from us. We're still experiencing the shame in the sense that, oh, well, we, we are still inclined towards sin. But the guilt of sin is completely removed. And in that, we recognize that uh, God has declared us righteous and made us holy in his sight. But we will still see evils in this world. And Job is basically extending this out from, from God, saying, well, God is the central pillar. And then from there, uh, my household, my, my family, so my brothers, they're estranged from me. Then also his kinsmen have gone away from him, his, then his friends, his maidservants, um, his, his manservants. And then he's also talking about his, his wife. And in verse 17 here, people assume my breath is offensive to my wife, to me that Job has bad breath. But really, when you look at what Job is trying to say, he's not saying that he has bad breath as, as a cause, uh, maybe pro as possibly caused by his skin disease that he's experiencing from Satan. But the actual meaning, I would say, and I would argue, is that his spirit, because the breath of life, that the, the spirit that is within man, his very spirit, his, uh, his being in this world is offensive to his wife. And this is more authentic to what uh, the exchange back in chapter 2 when, when Job's wife tells him, why do you hold on to your integrity, curse God, and die? Um, so Job being around, continuing in this life, is offensive to his wife in some way. Uh, I won't go into exactly how that is offensive because we don't know uh, the wife's motivation in her, her ca horrible counsel to Job to curse God and die. Or that is, uh, I hope that you die and have your, sending, your suffering ended, or uh, I hate you and I want you to die. We don't, we don't know which one it is. But either way, Job being alive is causing some grievance to his wife. So all the ones that Job counts close to him are gone, in some way, even even the friends that are counseling him, um, Eliphat, his Bildad, and so far, even even they're really against Job, and they're, they're uh, breaking him down uh, spiritually. So Job concludes in verse twenty: "I have nothing but skin and bones, and I've escaped with only the skin of my teeth." Now the expression "skin of my teeth," we don't really know that what that expression means because it only appears in Job. Anywhere, this is, by the skin of your teeth, 
this is where it comes from. This is the only reference we have in ancient literature uh, to this expression. So we don't have any comparison. Well, what does this mean? Basically, we can say, well, uh, might mean the gums, but it could just mean um, that since you don't have skin on your teeth because they're exposed, Job is escaping with some harm or w without uh, um, some protection or cover or something like that. So basically, Job is saying, I have nothing left in this world. And that's what you can experience when you're or, or can, can think when you're experiencing grief, which is, I have nothing left. And true, like some people who have experienced loss in this world have experienced crushing loss, that they've lost everything. But what is the case with Job is that even though Job has skin, nothing but skin and bones, he still has skin and bones. He still has his life. He's still present within this world because the Lord is still with him, still protecting him. Job doesn't know why he's left in this world. He's been asking for death thus far in the book. But Job, God still preserving him. So it's very ironic that Job concludes this particular section that verses 21 22. Have pity on me, my friends, have pity. For the hand of God has struck me. Why do you pursue me as God does? Will you never get enough of my flesh? It's ironic in the sense that God is pursuing Job in order to protect his flesh. God will never have enough of Job's flesh or enough of Job's life as God wants to give everlasting life to Job. God does not want Job to die, but to continue in faith into life everlasting. And this has been constant from the very beginning of the book until now. So when we are experiencing grave loss, we know that God is still with us in this world. We may not understand the circumstances around it, we may only concentrate on the loss, but God is still there. God is still upholding you. God is still loving you. And God is still providing to you life through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is why God sent Jesus into the world. He sent his son into the world so that we may not perish, but have everlasting life in him. And because we have everlasting life in Christ, we can actually overcome this loss. And the overcoming of loss will most likely not be in this world. Of course, we might overcome some small losses. Um, say you have some money returned to us or something like that. But the big losses, the losses of, of uh, relationships, the losses of people, the losses of, of uh, security and, and health and all these other things, uh, those will be restored in new heavens, new earth. We have to wait longer for these, but God does promise this. He is with us now until, until <laughs> basically eternity. So even though you're experiencing loss now, God still is with you. He is still upholding you, and he will never let you go. Amen. Let us conclude with the morning prayer. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things, that your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Please, O oh Lord, when we feel alone in this world and abandoned by you, please uphold us with your word and your sacraments and with the people within your church that we may not feel alone, but experience your goodness through the means of grace which you have given to us. Constantly uphold us in the faith that we might continue into life everlasting and regain what we have lost in this world, namely a life of righteousness and peace and security. Please, O Lord, guide us into life everlasting and preserve us in the faith. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord, bless us, defend us from all evil, and bring us into everlasting life. Amen.